This morning, I want to continue talking about possessing inheritance. Amen. I can hear some amens this morning. Hey, we're alive. Possessing inheritance. And we've looked at the prodigal son story, which is, which is uh, the parable in Luke 15, where Jesus talks about the two brothers that did not access the inheritance that was available from the compassionate father. One son ran off to go and live with the pigs and the prostitutes, and one son stayed with the father, which at first glance looks like the good brother. But he didn't access what was made available through the father either. He didn't even have a small goat, a little party with a few of his friends, never mind the whole town celebrating. And so accessing or possessing inheritance is not something that is automatic. Inheritance is automatic because it's got nothing to do with you. It's what God has done. And that is beautiful. And unless you see that and you see the grace of God made freely available as a free gift, it doesn't matter what you do. But if you see that, then you've got to respond in faith to receive the inheritance that God made available. So Andrew Ormack talks about grace and faith. Many people talk about grace and faith. But he t- anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go in rabbit trails that I'm going to try and cut out. Okay, I want to start up with a story this morning. There's a master carpenter. He is brilliant. At what he, I'm not talking about Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Kays was like, ooh, <laughs> master carpenter, really good at what he does. And he builds the most exquisite wooden houses, beautiful oak staircases. He is a genius. And he worked for a company for 30 years. And he is the go-to man in that particular, particular geography. If you want to build a mansion, this is the man you go to. And this man was coming to retirement and... He, he, uh, he had loved his career, but he had working for a company he wasn't quite happy with. He had been with them for 30 years, but he got a little bit despondent because some new boys had joined and he didn't quite like their atmosphere and the pay wasn't quite much more than he wanted. And so over a few years, he became a little bitter, he became a little sour about the job. Brilliant carpenter, and he really earned his money super well, but he decided, no, I'm going to retire. Not really happy. I'm going to move on. So he tells his boss... I'm going to move on. Thank you very much, but we're going to move. And, and so the boss says, him, listen, you've worked for me for so many years, and uh, I've really enjoyed working with you. you. You're brilliant. He says, can you just do me one personal favor before you leave? He says, I want you to build me a mansion. Shows him the plans. This is the most elaborate, beautiful house he's ever seen, ever put his hands on. And the carpenter begrudgingly agrees to do a personal favor to someone he calls a friend who has worked for for 30 years. Doesn't really want to do it, but I'm sort of in this. Let me do this one last project and I'll be off. So when he starts the project, he has sort of good intentions, but he cuts a few corners. He used some cheaper uh, supplies. He doesn't do the best job he can. It's good. By most people's standards, it's good. But for his standard, he's like, I I wouldn't like this, but I'm just going to do it. Finishes this beautiful, beautiful big mansion. And on the day that the carpenter hands the keys to the boss. The boss drives in, all the employees from the company, employees that have left and already retired come in to the house, and he's like, wow, this is a big deal. This must be a very important person that this mansion is for. And so the boss comes to him and says to him, Master Carpenter, we love you. We've always appreciated you. We know you haven't got paid as much as you should have during the track, but we knew what we were gonna do. The house that you have been building is a house that we planned for you. That master carpenter took shortcuts on his own house. He used cheaper building supplies for himself. And whilst he was bitter and upset and a little disturbed about the situation, he hurt his own inheritance. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about not missing the grace of God. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, do not miss the grace of God. Because God has an inheritance for you. He has the blessing for you. And you can miss it. By your own actions and your own thought processes. 
and you can curtail the destiny that God has for you and has freely given to you, this beautiful, wonderful journey, you can miss out on what he wants to bless you with by your own thoughts and by your own actions. Do not miss the grace of God. I need a volunteer. Jack. Yes, come, Judah. Okay, Jack, come stand here. God loves you. You know that. Come, Judah, come stand here. God loves you. You know that. Are you sure? Are you sure God loves you? Really? You? No, God loves you. <laughs> you know God loves you, right? Okay. The blessings of God. Matthew 5, 45 says, the blessing reigns on the just and the unjust. There is an inheritance and a blessing that God rains down, whether you understand it or not. Whether a two-year-old can fathom the idea of water droplets falling from heaven or not, doesn't change the fact that water falls from heaven. But you can have a Christian who understands that they have a responsibility to that inheritance and they do not miss the grace of God. And you can have a Christian like Judah who has a particular thought process or understanding that does miss the grace of God. Not because it stops the rain flowing, but because it stops the blessing over his life. Beautiful Christians, both. <laughs> okay, Mary, come stand here. Both Christians, both loved by God. One person can have the blessings of heaven flow all over them. And they just get an abundance of God's blessing. And they receive goodness. And they receive the sweets of heaven. <laughs> oh, God just loves me. Oh. <laughs> okay, Mary. So the blessing of God falls on all of us. But here we have a Christian who believes that God needs certain actions or requirements or that God stopped the blessing in, uh, after the Gospels. There was only a special anointed for the Gospels and then the blessing stopped. It's only if you're Jewish do you get the blessing. And so they do not access, they do not receive what God made freely available like Jack and they build a system. <laughs> And they build, hey, you shouldn't be eating the sweets. You have no access yet. <laughs> and so the blessing, the same blessing that fell on Jack is the blessing that doesn't fall. <laughs> and, when you, and when you ask this, this Christian, does the blessing exist today? God's God favor on you. Have you experienced God's grace? Their experience will tell you, no, it does not happen. There is no blessing of God anymore. And you ask them, why? How can you say that? The Bible says, oh no, that was only for that time. It was only for this circumstance. Because look, there is no blessing on my life. It just bounces off them. They don't see it. <laughs> and here you got the Christian in the same dispensation who receives grace upon grace upon grace. And their experience of the grace that's flowing over everyone is very different. <laughs> hey, you're a naughty, you're a naughty bad Christian. <laughs> Judah says, he may be naughty, but I'll be fat. Okay, get out of here. Take your umbrella and get out of here. No, it's fine. The grace of God flows with or without you it is independent of who you are what you do whether you believe it or not it happens but your experience will be vastly different dependent on whether you have a mindset that can contain the blessing and receive the blessing or you have a mindset that stops the blessing the responsibility is not on God to bless you we can say that with confidence because Ephesians 1.3 said he has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. 
So he, because of his loving compassion, has already made it, made your inheritance available. But you can be like the younger son or the older son who did not access what was made freely available. I want to say that the difference on whether you access or not is all about your mindset. I wanted a stupid little study that they did in some fancy university. And they took some hot coffee in a cup and they gave it to the subject of the study. And they didn't know that this was part of the study. The man gets in the elevator, he says, oh, can you hold my cup of coffee quickly? And he ties a shoelace or fills out a form quickly. And the subject held the coffee for, I think it was 10 seconds. Hot coffee. They get into the room. <laughs> Thank you, Terrence. They get into the study room and they read a text or they ask the subject to read a text. And then they ask questions about the text. And all of the subjects that held hot coffee in their hands were ab about 80% positive about the text that they experienced, that they were exposed to. They take the same uh, study, same circumstances, and they get a second gr group of people in now. And instead of getting them a hot cup of coffee, they give them a cold ice coffee. Same amount of time, same duration, sit them in the same room with the same questioner and give them the same text to read. And because now people had experienced something cold, 80% of the subjects said that the text was cold, that this person was distant. And the characters they had read about, they disliked. Hot coffee in your hand for 10, minute, uh, 10 seconds will give you a positive experience of the same text where someone who's exposed to something cold will read negatively. Now, that's some little psychological study in the back end of nowhere. Imagine your experience with God. The same Bible can be read by a group of people who make the assumption that God is cold, that he is distant, that he is hard, that he is difficult, that he's angry and judgmental. And they read the text and go, you see, 80% of them go, well, you see, he is cold and hard and distant. Same text can be read by CCI who experience a warm God, who loves them, the comfort and compassion. And they read their text and they go, wow, look at the love of the Father. Look how close he brings me. Look how warm he makes me feel. Oh, no, feelings are bad. Look how warm he makes me feel. Your opinion of who the Father is is incredibly influenced by what you're taught and what you're exposed to. And some people, through religious training or through experiences that happened them, to them on earth through their growing up, are given cold cups of coffee. And when they hold that coffee for a short amount of time, seeds are planted in their minds about who the Father is. And then their experience will confirm the opinion they develop by that influence. And see, see, he is cold. See, God does give you cancer. You see, God does bring you trials to make you holy. And they will read the text, both of the Bible and of their lives, and confirm that's what he's like. The beautiful thing about that is 10 seconds with a hot cup of coffee. 10 seconds in his presence and his love and his acceptance. A little glimpse into what he thinks about you. Oh, it'll change your whole life. You'll see in a moment, you'll go, my father loves me. My father can accept me. And when you come under that influence, you actually start to experience the love of the father. The text, same words, will change everything in your experience. So that's why for decades in this church, we have emphasized anointing. We have emphasized God's love. We have, ex we have emphasized the hot coffee moments. <laughs> that's why Rob always preaches. Just get into his presence every morning. Wake up, say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Because if you just have a little moment in his presence, it'll change everything in your life. 
People sometimes, myself included, we sometimes just go too long without having a touch of heaven. And we start to get cold and the world looks gloomy. And you read the BBC and the CNN reports and they say, everything's going to end. Nuclear wars on the edge of happening. And then three months later, they're saying the same news headline. And COVID's going to kill us all. And now it's Putin. Putin's going to threaten us all with, we're all dead, we're all dead. And that's because it gets the clicks. And so we get trapped in the media cycles. And this is always the case. It all, because it's so uh, exciting in a negative way. So you, oh, oh no, how are we all going to die? So it keeps you holding a cold cup of coffee. God hates you and is going to judge you. Oh, let me listen to what they're going to say. Let me hold the cold cup of coffee for a little too long. And you start to think that way. And deposits are made in your mindset that separate you. It doesn't stop the blessing of God flowing. It doesn't stop his love. But it starts to build a mindset above your own head which reconfirms itself and you end up in a vicious cycle of separation between you and God. Somebody say amen. amen. The antidote to that is you need to come to your senses. Luke 15, we've read it for two weeks. The oldest son is at home working hard trying to earn and deserve the blessing. We know you can't do that. The youngest son went crazy. And he went off to gamble all his inheritance on prostitutes and ended up in the pigsty. And then in Luke 15, verse 17, it says, whilst he's in this absolute destitute place, he realizes, I'm in trouble. That's not coming to his senses. That's easy to gauge. He comes to his senses through an idea. Let's bring up that verse. I don't think it's the full context, but... I might read some other verses. Let's bring up Luke 15. This is the younger, speak, the younger son speaking. He's full of pig poo, stinky, hungry, destitute. And he says, uh, humiliated, the fun, the, the fun, finally realized he w- what he was doing. And he thought, umbrella heads, umbrella heads. All of us are umbrella heads at some point. There are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want and plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Now they're servants. They're servants. They don't have freedom. They are obliged by penalty of the sword to obey their master. And yet from this son's perspective he sees the freedom that they have because whilst he's a son who can do whatever he wants he's out begging and he's in a pigsty he looks at who's really locked up that's why we said last week plenty of rich people who are in extreme poverty because they may have money but it's a tomb for them i was saying to john earlier we teach Maths and English and all sorts of subjects in rich. You don't know the money that's in this little area in Saikung and Clearwater Bay. The mansions and the Mercs and the Ferraris all in the same house. You don't know the money that's around here. And we walk into these houses because we are a very expensive service. And you look at all the butlers and the maids and the garden and the drivers and all of these servants. And you look at the kids. They are depressed. Heads down. No confidence. No love. No warmth, just cold, cold, cold. And a few of them will get really, really arrogant with how much money they have and the car that they have and the holiday they took. And you look at the photo and you just see sad, desperate, lonely people. I'm telling you, that's one of the things that delivered me from trying to chase after money because there's very poor, rich people. So the son who has all the credibility of being the son of this rich guy goes look at the freedom that those servants have and you know what what actually makes them look free to the son is the fact that they're connected to the father look at the servants in my father's house they lack nothing they have leftovers after they eat their fill and they're servants 
He says, why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? That's what those kids in rich people's houses, not all of them, but some of them, they're eating slop. Rich slop, but it's slop. And so I want you to notice this. The, the son finally realized what he was doing and thought. Let's bring up that other version. I believe it's the NIV. It says, when he came to his senses. What was the thought that he changed? And what was him coming to his senses? It was that when you're connected to the Father, even if you're the bottom of the heap, even if you're the servant, you have more than enough. You see, he thought when he asked his father for an inheritance to take it, he thought that was the answer. But he did, disconnected himself from the father. What was coming to his senses was the connection with the father. And so the story then goes... In his rehearsed speech, I'm going to go back to the father. I'm going to say, let me just be a servant in your house because a servant's better off than me because at least I'll be connected to you. And as he runs up, the father sees him from a distance way off. Father's waiting on the doorstep looking for his son to come. And we all know the father ran to him and embraced him. The passion calls him the compassionate father. When you see your father as cold, hard, distant, that will be your experience. Because the other brother was at home with the father and he was out working hard all day, and didn't get anything. But the younger brother, he experienced compassion because he knew that the state that, was, that he was in was so disgusting and stinky, he knew he deserved nothing of sonship. But when he saw his father running to him, he knew there was nothing about his condition that could stop the love of the Father. I want you to know that if you don't approach the Father based on your sin or your bad habits or what you do externally, as Rob calls it, if you base your relationship with your Father on your condition, then you are going to have a cold, hard experience like the older brother. But if like the younger son, you come to your senses and think correctly and have a good opinion of who the father is, your experience will be of compassion and warmth. Because even whilst you're a far way off, stinky, pooey, prostitute, the compassionate father will come and make you the first. He'll put the first robe on you and the ring and the sandals and slaughter the fattened calf for you. I want to challenge you this morning. In order to miss the grace of God, it looks like the older brother not even getting a little goat. Missing the, greater, uh, the grace of God is not what the younger brother did because he at least approached the father in his stinky behavior, in his smell. But most of us are trained religiously and in the world to get ourselves right before we'll go to God. And I can't do that just yet. I've just got to get over this addiction. I can't come to church just yet. I've just got to get my thinking right in this particular area. And then once I know how to do these things, then I'll come to God. No, you can murder someone with the blood still on your hands and say, Father, here I am. And from a long way off, he'll accept you with compassion. That is offensive to the older brother. If you're offended by that thought, you need to reassess your thoughts about the Father. Because does He accept you based on what you do? No. No. Pigs and prostitutes are detestable to the Jewish Father. And yet from a long way off, He accepted Him. Murder would have been nicer than the smell of pigs in Jewish culture. There were certain cities, if you murdered someone, you could go and hide in. But if you ate bacon sandwiches, you were defiled. You were dirty. There's no special city for you. God does not accept you based on your condition. So stop approaching him based on your condition. Approach him based on the fact that he's compassionate. 
I'm, I'm telling you, there's theologies out there that are so against the prosperity gospel and God's blessing. They are so built to defend against the idea that God will bless you despite you, that they have put the umbrella up on the blessing over their own lives. And so they will purposely miss out on the grace of God to prove the point that you are a dirty, horrible sinner. And you should be thankful for the sickness that comes on your life. There are people, we watched a two-hour video last night, on people who think that God decrees all evil, and you should thank Him when you get raped and murdered. Well, you can't thank Him once you're murdered, but... <laughs> because He decreed... That's what some Christians... Bible, they read the same text we read. There are demonic theologies out there. And I'm giving you extreme versions. There's much more polite versions and variations of that same idea. Most Christians believe that when you get cancer, God's giving it to you to make you holy. I, I, I can guess that most people in this room at one point in your lives believe that. I did. When you got AIDS, it was because you were naughty and you should get AIDS. That's what I believed. And not subconsciously, I worked that out in my brain and argued with my friends as an 18-year-old that if someone gets AIDS, they deserve it. Consciously. Now, most Christians are unconscious about what they believe. And so they will come to that action and behavior without even a conscious thought of, of how they think. If you approach God... Based on your condition, you're in trouble. You need to understand that he is a compassionate father and he has no regard for your condition. He has regard for you. He so loved the world that even whilst you were dead in your sins and transgressions, that he died for you. So he dealt with your condition so it was no longer a barrier. What becomes the barrier is that you believe that your condition is still an issue, even though he already solved it. Stop trying to solve a problem that God already solved. Just approach him. Even if you had the little corner of a door open, you go, okay, I'll just even be a servant in your house. Even that's good enough to approach him. Because he'll upgrade you as the second you arrive. His love is compassion will just warm you up. You read the text again. You go, oh, my God loves me. If he saved me whilst I was in my worst state, why wouldn't he love me now? Because now he's covered me with his blood. But people don't approach boldly because they've been taught to hold cup, cold cups of coffee. Come to your senses. Think rightly about who your father is. He's not cold, hard, judgmental. He is loving, forgiving, and gracious. When you feel that cold, hard condemnation, come to your senses. Assess it. Why am I feeling like this? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Assess it. Be conscious in your life. Like start to, you know when you're driving along in a road and you look at the dashboard and you've got, you've got different gauges. You've got a speedometer. You've got how much fuel is left in the tank. If you turn off your consciousness and you stop thinking about how much fuel it is or your speed, you're going to end up in trouble because either the police is going to stop you or your lack of fuel is going to stop you. You need to be conscious about how much fuel you got left. How much more important it is, it is it to monitor your soul and have gauges that measure, am I feeling the peace of God or not? Am I having the flow of grace influence my life, that warm cup of coffee? Because if it isn't influencing your life, it's only a matter of time until the car stops or the police pull you over. <laughs> okay, Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about a parable of... A master, he owns some land, and he's got, a, a, I think, a vineyard or a farm on it. And he says to the three servants, he says, I'm going away on a long journey, and I'm going to give you some of my funds for you to uh, look after and maintain whilst I'm gone away. I'll be back a few years later. To the first servant, he gives five talents. To the second, he gives two. And to the third, he gives one. Everyone heard this parable before. Anyway, the first servant invests the five talents. He goes into business. He starts a second farm. He hires this thing out. He takes some risks. He starts to work the money that God or the master had given him. 
and he earns an interest and a return on the investment. And he makes, he doubles his investment. Second servant does the same thing. And so now we have the servant with 10 talents or 10 bags of money. And we have this, the second servant with four bags of money now. And the third servant, who started with one, he does nothing with it. He takes that bag, he puts it in the ground, and hides it away. The master comes back. First servant says, look, I've doubled your money. God says, well, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the joy, the big feast party. Second servant, I've doubled your money. Same deal. Third servant, he says, I knew you were a hard man. Where you reaped where you didn't sow, and you harvest where you didn't plant seed. And so I took the money, and I hid it, because I wanted you to get back what you had given me. That is the state of most Christians. God's given me something, got to protect it, defensive, not do anything, not make any mistakes. Because God is a hard taskmaster. Let's just read that, that verse there, John from Matthew 25. This is then the interaction from when the servant announces what he did. He said, Then the one who had been entrusted with the 1,000 or one talent had come to his master and said, Look, sir, I know that you are a hard man to please. That's his mindset. The, the other two did not have that same mindset. So they were able to manifest the inheritance. They were able to increase on what God had given them. But this third servant, he had the opinion and the idea, the umbrella head. He had the opinion that God was a hard man to please. And that you're a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others. <laughs> this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus talking. I, I've got employees, or have had employees, who thought that about me. I've grown rich on the back of others. Now, I'm not incredibly rich. I, I feel I'm incredibly wealthy. But my bank account isn't huge. It's healthy. I won't die tomorrow if I stop earning money. But the accusation is, you've got rich on the back of others. We'll look at that in a second. It's, it's how, how do I defend that argument? You can't. It's a very hard argument to fight against. Because he is a shrewd businessman. He is shrewd. And he has made money through working with other people and employing people and business. And he has done deals that have favored him more than the other person. But the mindset is... Uh, He's just using people. When you enter into those sort of mindsets, you're in very difficult territory to come back from. It's possible, but most people who start going down that idea with how dare you be blessed and I'm not blessed, it's very hard to remove those ideas. Very hard. Very small people, very bitter, very angry, upset with the world. How dare they inherit the blessing. How dare they access, and then they twist it and pervert it and say it's because they're bad. That's most of the Christian world. How dare you be healthy and wealthy? There's sick people in the world. They had the very same argument against Jesus. Do you know that they said to Jesus? He said, you're always going to have the poor, but I'm only here for a short time. Celebrate me. He had, it wasn't small-minded. And then he said to the poor, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. He's provided a solution for poor people. Poor people, ah, kingdom. Shrewd and ruthless businessman, growing rich on the back of others. I was afraid of you. Bad opinion. Why weren't the first two afraid? Why did they have a go and take a risk and try the opportunity? I was afraid of you. Bad mindset. So I went and hid your money and buried it in the ground. But here it is. Take it. It's yours. Angered by what he heard, the master said to him. I want you to watch this word, anger. Most Christians will teach you that God gets angry with sin. 
what is Jesus saying that the master gets angry with you? A bad opinion of who he is. Not with your sin. He covered your sin. He paid for your sin. What God gets angry about is umbrella head Christians who stop the blessing flowing through bad mindsets. The older brother mentality that says, no, I can't access anything that God has for me. That's what angers him. God can deal with sin. He's already dealt with it. What he can't deal with is free will individuals refusing the grace of God. Because we have the choice to put our umbrella heads up. Which is wonderful news. Because it means we also have the choice to remove the umbrella. And to come to our senses. So look at this angry master. He says, next slide. You're an untrustworthy and lazy servant. What an insult. He says, if you knew I was a shrewd and ruthless businessman, if you really followed through on the idea that I got rich on the back of others, if you really extrapolated your belief system, he says, uh, who always makes a profit, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank if I'm really that horrible? No, you're lazy. You're untrustworthy. You didn't want to partake anyway. You didn't want to engage with me. You didn't want to be my servant. So you hid the talent, you hid the money, you hid the investment, and you ignored it. But because you were unfaithful, the prosperity gospel is so hated because they look, the religious Christian will look at God's prosperity and go, that is unfaithful. But that's not what Jesus said in this parable. He said, your hard mentality and bad opinion of the master is unfaithful. I will take your talent or bag of gold and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Actually, I wasn't going to say this, but I am going to say this because I need to double down on this idea. Let's bring up that next slide. It's 29, 25, 29. Look at what Jesus says here. Economists call this the Matthew principle. It's a very powerful principle. And it says, for the one who has, uh, for the one who has will be given more until he overflows with abundance. So the five who made another five, now he's got 10, he gets the other one. Jesus is saying, if you're able to manifest your inheritance, if you're able to possess what God has given you, access the blessing and remove your umbrella head, he says, I'm going to give you even more so that you're overflowing with abundance, that it's more than enough, that when you leave the table, you have leftovers. God, just give me enough small prayers. No, that's not the father's heart. He wants to give you more than enough. And the one with hardly anything, even what little he has will be taken away. Ooh. We have this idea that if someone doesn't have, we should give it to them. And the person who does have, it must be taken away. I'm not talking politics here, although it can apply to politics. I'm talking about the Christian mindset. Father, why don't you bless that poor person who's been in church for 30 years and they never, 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 never get. So let's bless them. The father says, no, I'm going to bless those who access the blessing. Those who have access to my blessing and take away their umbrella head, those people I'm going to give more and more and more because they can receive what I've given them. And they're going to receive so much that they have an overflowing abundance. That's what the father honors. But to the one who has the umbrella head about how good he is and their opinion of who is, oh, he's hard. God will judge you for your sin. To those people, I can't bless them. So even if they've got a little bit left, what they do have left is going to be expanded and be siphoned off to the one who has a good opinion about me. If you've got bad ideas about who God is and about his judgment, I recommend, I plead, I beg Leave those ideas and start focusing on the goodness of God and his compassion and his love. Whether it be the area, area of finance, 
Great, focus on his goodness, focus on his blessing. Read the scriptures about Joseph and the wealth that he had access to. And the Jesus' coat and all the stories about the wealth of God. Focus on that. Oh no, the love of money. Well, don't love money, love God. Jesus was very rich. You know, before he was two years old, he had wise men, not three wise men, hundreds of wise men come and give him silver. No, not silver. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Maybe some silver too. Silver, gold, and bronze. He got all the prizes. Jesus was rich before he did anything. Oh no, wealth is bad. Okay, you're saying Jesus is bad? To those who are given, even more will be given. But you know, wealth is the smallest, littlest thing. What about your health? What about the integrity of your soul and your thoughts about who your father is? What about the ability to walk in peace no matter what's happening around you? Those are much more valuable. What about your faith, which is the ability to receive from that abundance? If you've got faith, you can get silver and gold. Silver and gold can't get you faith. These are so much more important. But people get caught up with finance. Smallest little thing. Cattle, cattle on a thousand hills. He can sort out your finance problem like this. What he can't solve is your umbrella head. You're the only one who has access and responsibility to change your mindset about who he is. Because the influence is already there. The grace is already flowing. He has clearly made it visible to everyone, whether you're Christian or not. It's your choice to control your opinion about who he is. And there are situations that arise that look impossible in your life. And you've got to look at those situations and go, I don't know the way through on this. But I'm going to choose to believe that my God is good. Bad things will happen to you that are in irreversible. A loved one could die. You could lose a limb. And you've still got to choose, choose by your free will, that God is good. I'm going to have a good opinion about who he is. You can miss the grace of God. It's your choice. You don't have to get grace flowing. It's already flowing. It's your responsibility to by faith access that which is already freely given. Let's bring up Ephesians 2.8. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Grace has already come. And it says, through faith. So faith, as Rob says, faith takes what grace has made available. Romans 5.2 says, it's by faith we have access to his grace. In which we now stand. But some people are standing in grace with an umbrella. <laughs> like Mary Poppins. The prodigal son came to his senses. He had a good opinion about God. Okay, let's bring up Hebrews 12. This is my last scripture for today. So this is the writer of Hebrews. Most people think it's Paul. And he's writing to... He's actually... It doesn't matter. Sean, rabbit trails. He's writing, he's saying, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Most Christians are debating whether grace extends to them or not. That is a problem solved. Grace has been extended to everyone. God is the compassionate, loving Father, no matter your condition. That is settled. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. All of the legalistic requirements that old covenant thinking tried to make people jump through, all of that was finished. And now we approach based on the person who approached perfectly, Jesus. So we enter into that grace, not by our work, but by his work. That's what faith is. It's a receipt of what he has already done. So grace has been extended to you. But you can fall short of that which has already been extended to you by putting up your umbrella. So that's why the writer says, be careful that you don't fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up causing trouble and by this many become defiled don't miss the grace of God don't fall short of it because if you do 
umbrella head who has a bad opinion about who God is and has a bad theology about his hardness and his coldness will fall short of the blessings of his inheritance, what God's already freely given him, and will look at Jack, who's accessing freely and just receiving gift upon gift upon gift. Going, wow, God, I just... And then this person goes, but hold on, they've got sin in their lives. But they don't even know the whole Bible. But I saw this stupid idea that they put on Facebook that is completely wrong and unbiblical. But they watch so-and-so movie. And as they receive more and more blessing, my shortness, my falling short of the grace of God, will make me bitter that they accessed. Once that root of bitterness springs up in my heart, it becomes an ideology, it becomes a framework, it becomes an umbrella that is very difficult for an external force to change. Only me, uh, you can only open an umbrella from the inside. It's only me who can control that bitterness. And because I've put an umbrella between me and God, even he finds it difficult to change my idea about who he is. If you're in the middle of the pigsty and your whole view is pigsty, it doesn't matter how compassionate the father is on the doorstep, calling, loving, preparing feasts. It doesn't matter what he's doing. If your whole mindset is about you and your pigsty, unless you come to your senses, you're going to miss out on what's freely available. Imagine I come to you and I say, hey, there's a buffet. There's a big party. Come to the buffet. Come. Come and eat. It's good. Oh, this is the best meat you're ever going to have. Oh, the veggies are the best. Even if you're a vegetarian, you're welcome. <laughs> and you go, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to that party. Bonnie's there. <laughs> and Bonnie once said an unholy word. And so all your friends go to the party and they'll partake and they enjoy it and they're singing and dancing and we're praising God and we're just having the best time, just receiving abundance. If you're the person who doesn't go because of some offense or some bitterness or some jealousy, that bitterness, no one can phone you from the party and say, hey, come and join it. It's going to double down that irritation and frustration in you. So the loving father phones you from heaven says hey i want you to partake of this party that i've laid on for you to come and part come and enjoy it and like the older brother stand outside and go i won't enter in i've worked hard he didn't work hard how can he receive i'm not going to enjoy it i want to encourage you enter into your inheritance lose the ideas that god is hard and difficult and judges you and needs your condition to be X, Y, and Z before you can access the blessing. Like the younger prodigal son, he accessed the father. And as he accessed the father, everything about his condition was upgraded with the father. He took the smell away from him. He put the coat on and put the shoes on him. He changed his condition because the son approached. You can only have your condition changed because you approach the Father, regardless of your condition. Grace didn't save you so you could stay the same. Yeah, that's true. It's grace. It's unmerited favor that he placed upon you regardless of your condition. And as you walk with the Father, he will change you. But you don't change so you can walk with the Father. Just walk with him anyway. It doesn't matter how dirty, smelly, stinky you are. Just walk with him. Stick with him. Stop with the umbrella ahead ideas. And you will change. And you will partake of the inheritance that he's made available for you. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you. I had this, as I've been prepping and praying about this, I had this weird thought about this Hebrews 12, 15. One of the inoculations to bitterness is to access that unmerited favor. I don't know if it's, maybe it's the only one. When you access, Galatians 5, 22 talks about the nine fruits of the fifth spirit. Galatians 5, 25 says, and do not envy. 
your ability to not be bitter or jealous or covet or envy comes because you've already accessed the Holy Spirit. There's an empowerment to not be envious and not be jealous because you've already accessed who the Spirit is and what He produces in your life. But if you try and solve your bitterness, I'm not going to be bitter. I'm really angry with that person. Tracy, how dare she do that? Oh, I'm really angry. And you try and maintain and prune that root of business, you're going about it the wrong way around. That'll spill over to other people. Because in your pruning of your bitterness, you'll talk to your neighbor and say, you know when Tracy did that thing? Now, I've really been struggling with this. But she did, 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 did and it starts to spread like a growth. And so the one employee speaks to the other employee to say how bad and harsh the boss is. And now it spreads. So now you've got three, four people who even what they have has to be taken. And no matter how the boss, and I've been through this, I had to fire three people on one day as the boss, as the harsh. And you're reconfirming, you are doubling down on their opinion of you that you're horrible. Because you're pleading with them saying, hey, this is a root of bitterness. You've got a bad idea. That's a twisted fact. That's a perversion of the truth. Yes, this thing happened and I'm wrong and I'm sorry, but that's not who I am. We've changed this and this and this. The bad idea sets in and now it spreads. And now you've got to chop out a whole root. It's terrible. And nothing you can say can change that person's mind. So it defiles many. Whole churches have been defiled by a bad image of God. Whole church movements have been defiled with this bitterness. That's why there's a hatred of the blessing. The persecuted son is Isaac. Not Ishmael. Ishmael's not persecuted. He's doing the persecuting. Because the blessing's on Isaac. I want to challenge you. The protection against a root of bitterness is receiving grace upon grace upon grace. So whatever it is you're facing, where you feel like you've been left out, or your prayer hasn't been answered, or you've struggled with a particular area and it hasn't worked, or that person's getting better treatment than you, I want you to say, Father, bless me. Don't pray, Father, don't bless them. <laughs> <laughs> Father, this is unfair. <laughs> Why them? <laughs> it's lazy theology. It's lazy ideas. It's cold cup of coffee. You need to pray, Father, bless me. If you can do it for Terence, and I don't think he deserves it. Amen. Amen. And the Father would agree with you. He doesn't deserve it. But his son made him worthy. I want to challenge you, if you're struggling with that, don't pray about Terence. Say, Father, bless me. Father, help, help me to have the confidence to take my umbrella down and receive from your blessing and access the inheritance you've already given me. And I promise you, if you're praying that prayer with faith, Sometimes you've got to pray it six times until faith springs up. But if you pray that prayer with faith, before you've closed the umbrella, you will feel the drops of heaven's dew start to bless you. You will get the phone call. You'll get the email. You'll get the sense of peace. Even before the thing has happened. Don't allow a root of bitterness to spring up in your life. Not because you have a sin behavior. But because you miss out on the grace of God. Don't miss the grace of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss the grace of God. Okay, that's part one. Part two, no. <laughs> I do have a part two. We'll preach it next week. Father, I thank you for this beautiful church. I thank you for these beautiful people. And Lord, I thank you that we have a momentum of finding mercy and grace in our time of need. I thank you that we have such a culture of praising you for what you're able to do. And Lord, for celebrating the joy that we enter into as uh, successful servants who do well with what you've given us. And Father, I pray that you give us even more. I pray that you bless us even more. In this time where there's threats of nuclear war and 
and famine and uh, fuel prices and all, all the difficulties that are happening in the earth. Lord, I pray that you bless us more. Well, I pray against the negativity. I pray for more positivity in my life. I pray for more wealth. Lord, I thank you that you can bless us to a point where we have so much abundance, we have to open up a second bank account. Thank you, Father, for rich relationships. I thank you that people put their heads on their pillows at night going, Lord, thank you for the friends that I have around. Thank you for the family that once hated me but now has loved me. Lord, I pray for that compassion to be over every element of my life. I pray that there is such a spillover of goodness that even my boss, who's a horrible person, experiences some of your goodness, that they see some of your light in my eyes. We thank you, Father. We bless our government here in Hong Kong, that even though some people may disagree with some of the things, we bless our government in Hong Kong. We bless our government in Beijing, and we thank you for the authority that they are under in heaven. And so we pray pray for blessing, even over bad plans, even over evil plans. We pray for a blessing that demonstrates your goodness, Father. We do not celebrate bad things. We do not celebrate evil things on this earth. We celebrate your goodness and your divine purposes that you portray through us. Thank you. And ultimately, Father, we thank you for your son. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us and your acceptance of us. As our older brother, you brought us into who you are. Thank you for everything that you did for us. And our best thanks is not the word thank you. Our best thanks is to actually receive what you gave us. Lord, we're going to open the present of the blessing every single day. We're not going to put this pristine wrap box on our mantelpiece and look at it and go, look at God's gift of grace to us. We are going to unwrap that present and violently open every element of it and explore it and partake of it. Thank you for the blessing. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Yay!